to another Aim High English session with your boy Phil Wilcox. I'm really keen to get cracking, get started. Um, we're going to be looking at the topic today, why violence isn't as bad as you've been told. Um, I'm going to start things off uh, just, just with a little bit of a question. I want to know why is Cinderella R rated? Why do you think Cinderella is R rated? I mean, it's not R rated. Why should it be R rated? Why should Cinderella be R rated? Wow, I'm getting so much low on the chat line. So much caps lock. Yeah, we're not doing caps lock today, but I appreciate if you're doing caps lock. Oh, a lot of usual suspects here. Hey, Phoebe. Hey, Jeff is cooler. Uh, never watch the film. Get out of the freezer. Said graphic nudity. Uh, there's no graphic nudity, thankfully. Um, uh, but why might it be R-rated? Because their stepmothers and stepsisters abuse her? Yeah, they do. Because birds peck out the stepsister's eyes, Jack. Pan maple. Yes, you're touching on something really true. That does not happen in the movie, the Disney movie version that we see. Uh, but actually in the original story, um, well, it's a fairy tale, so it's sort of passed along. But the most famous version of the story, um, the Brothers Grimm, actually, they wrote a very, very gory version of Cinderella um, and in that version, when the stepsisters, remember that scene where the stepsisters were trying on the slippers to try and, you know, prove that they were the one who danced with the prince and lost the slipper and it belonged to them. Um, they couldn't fit into the slipper. So they like cut off their toes and their toes were bleeding and they had these amputated stubs of feet to try and get in that slipper. They were so desperate to be, um, to be a princess. Um, and actually at the end, Japan Maple was right. They were punished by having their eyes gouged out by birds. Now, this is a children's book. This is a fairy tale. Um, and, uh, this is the kind of violence that was there. Violence is all around. There's violence in so much art and we're going to be exploring violence in art. Um, specifically, uh, I just want to say from the outset, violence in real life, absolutely not okay in my idea, in my, in my view. Um, you almost certainly have rules at school about bullying, about violence. There's rules in the workplace. There's laws. Um, absolutely not okay. I just want to say that from the outset. Um, also, I don't want any violence in the chat. We're going to keep this really safe. We're going to keep this PG-13 because... We, um, yeah, I don't, I, I think you can be violent with your words as well. And, uh, we're going to be kind and supportive and I'm just going to a little, little bit of a shout out there. Yeah. Get out of the freezer said wholesome. Yes. That's what we're going to be. We're going to be wholesome. Uh, uh, violence can go jump off a microwave. No bullying. Woo woo. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to keep it real clean. Uh, a lot of peace, a lot of love for the peace in the chat line. Thanks. Posey Joe. Uh, <laughs> Uh, okay, great. Uh, Kieran White said, Brother Grimm is gruesome. Brothers Grimm are gruesome. They wrote some gruesome versions of fairy tales that, um, all the ones that you would have heard of, like Beauty and the Beast, fully gruesome versions. Um, so now that we've agreed, and I see from the chat line that everyone's agreed that violence is not okay in real life. What do we think though about this question? Is it okay for art to ever be violent. So obviously, uh, maybe you can name, uh, some of the, uh, the artworks present here. We've got some cartoons, we got some paintings, got a book. Uh, are you familiar with any of them? Do you like any of them? Um, what do you think? Is it okay for art to be violent? Let's see what people say. Posey Joe said, art is subjective. That's interesting. Um, by subjective, I think Posey Joe, you're saying that um, art is different for everybody. Um, are there any standards that should be, uh, on art across the board, uh, for violence? What do you reckon? All right. I've gotten some love for Tom and Jerry forever. 
it's art, it's expression of emotion. So I guess it's okay. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, uh, there's a lot of people here who, uh, some movies were so gruesome. They got banned. Some countries like the human centipede. Yes. There are some movies that get banned from certain countries. Some books as well are so violent. They get banned. Um, uh, what do you think? Uh, what do you think? Is it okay for art to be violent? Um, a lot of people are saying, well, you know, uh, it, art is different things for different people. So yeah, maybe go for it. Which is an interesting question, right? Because if art is okay to be violent in art, but it's not okay to be violent in real life, what does that, what does that mean? And what might it have to do with these two images here? Tell me why these two images might relate to this question here. What do you reckon, guys? Also, how great is this darts player dude? Um, oh yeah. Another question, what is this darts player dude? What meme, kind of old meme now, what meme does it remind you of? All right, let's have a look. Uh, let's say, okay. All right, uh, I enjoy horror and it can be heavily violent even though I'm the opposite of violent in real life, Posey Joe. That is so interesting. Obviously you love horror, but you're not gonna be a horrific psychopathic murderer. Uh, interesting. Um, Maddie Rez says, Hunger Games makes me hungry. Uh, darts are dangerous. Uh, okay, uh, some interesting ones here. Um, the difference between these two pictures here is that one of these is a manual. So one of these is an instructional guide on how to play a game that involves pointy things. The other is a piece of art. And yes, I'm calling Hunky Games art. Uh, depicting pointy things going in to people very violently. Um, this is telling you how to do something. This is describing something. So this one here is <clears throat> prescriptive. So it's how to do something. And this book here is descriptive, even though it's describing something that didn't actually happen in real life, it's describing events, it's descriptive. Now, because it is descriptive, describing something that happened, even if it didn't happen, it doesn't need to be completely 100%, I, in my view, it doesn't need to be above board. If, however, there was a Hunger Games instructional manual on how to grab, get a, a group of teenagers, put them into an arena, torture them with horrific kind of like um, obstacles and make them fight to the death, that's the plot of Hunger Games, then maybe there'll be something messed up about Hunger Games um, kind of manual. But there is something different if it's prescriptive rather than descriptive. Um, a lot of chat here, uh, Hunger Games isn't violent on the screen. It's not violent, but it alludes to violence, which in some ways is violence as well. You don't have to necessarily show it. You can imply it and it can still be violent. I think, uh, <laughs> Japan neighbor says, I don't think anyone's going to read Hunger Games and be like, cool. Okay. Going to kill some kids. No, I don't think so either. Hopefully. Um, we're going to expl explore violence in art and see when it's okay and when it's not okay. So let's start off with this guy here. This guy is Walter Wink. And he came up with this idea that in so many pieces of art and so many stories that we have, there is a common theme. There's a common cycle of retributive violence. So violence of retribution. So you do something, I do something back. We're going to explore this with one of the oldest, oldest stories ever written. Uh, it's the creation myth of the Babylonians, the ancient Babylonians. Um, 
And Walter Wink explores how this is the blueprint. This is the first ever example of retributive violence. And actually almost every story fits into this. So let's have a look. Okay, so before we get, begin, this story uh, is from the Enuma Elish, which is a, um, it's a creation story, but it's also a battle story. And there are two main characters. There's one on the left and one on the right. Now I want you to tell me which one of these is the good guy and which one is the bad guy. What do you reckon? Which one's the good guy? Which one's the bad guy? <laughs> uh, Get Out of the Free said, Wink is an excellent second name. It is Walter Wink? I mean, how good is that name? Uh, depends on whose perspective you are looking from. Left is bad and right is good. That's Jeff is cooler. The man is the good guy. That's uh, okay. The one on the right is bad. Oh, interesting. The one on the right is bad. The bad guy is the man. Oh, good, right, left, bad. Interesting. Well, we don't have, a, you know, I just, I just assumed that everyone would think that uh, this character was the bad guy. Um, and this guy was the good guy. Um, but you know what? That's very um, people centric of me. And uh, no, actually in this story, yes, this one is the goddess Tiamat. And Tiamat is the goddess of evil and chaos and darkness. And this here is Marduk. And Marduk is the hero and the king of the gods. But he didn't start off being the king of the gods. This is the story of how that happened. So to start off with Walter Wink, thinks that every single story starts the same in chaos, but primal chaos. Uh, primal just means, you know, from the beginning, from the very raw start of things. So in the very raw start of things, in the creation of the world, the goddess Tiamat was the ruler. The goddess Tiamat was a chaotic ruler who ruled brutally, enslaving the other gods, keeping them under pump. That's the story of how the Babylonian, uh, what they say. Now, uh, you'll find that in lots of stories, a lot of them start in a place of kind of, mm, things are not always great. Uh, for instance, in Lord of the Rings, there's something not very great. Mordor is increasing in power. Uh, the, uh, the orcs are multiplying, the trolls are getting smarter, and all the armies are gathering. There's this primal chaos that exists. There's this badness that exists. Um, and then there's the second phase. It just intensifies and intensifies and intensifies. And this is an ancient word, tamuz, which means the day of reckoning. So you know that bit in Lord of the Rings where like, Sauron collects all his armies together. It's the day of reckoning. Or, for instance, when uh, Gotham City is under siege and is in chaos uh, and all of that is happening, there's a day of reckoning. It's just like a build-up, a build-up. And Walter Wink says that when we hear stories that uh, have this kind of darkness build-up at the start, weirdly, we can indulge our fantasies in thinking that, you know, indulge our fantasies of darkness and dabble in it. So for instance, in, um, in the dark Knight, there are so, there's so much love for the Joker character, uh, Heath Ledger's Joker, less so Jared Leto's Joker character. Um, and, uh, but there's so much sympathy for these kind of charismatic villains. Um, anyway, uh, that's what Walter Wink said. So Tiamat was building up, building up. He, Tiamat found out that there was a plot to overthrow her and so enslaved all the other gods and had a plan that was gonna, she was going to kill them all. Uh, and in response to all this darkness, a hero rises. This is literally a, uh, this is literally a drawing, a comic book drawing of uh, a serialized, um, I don't know if it's DC or Mar Marvel version of Marduk. Uh, Marduk the hero rises up, but Marduk the hero says, look, I will overthrow Tiamat if 
when I do, you will make me the supreme king and ruler of all the gods. Um, and so what happens here is in story, there's a hero who rises up, but then there is might equals right. So Aragorn rises up to take his, uh, to overthrow Sauron. And because of that, he is made king. Um, there is sort of like a need to be right uh, because I'm going to be the hero who rises up. So heroism. And then there's triumph. So in this story of Tiamat, Marduk rises up, has a revolution against Tiamat, and then in a very creative and gory way, kills Tiamat, um, splits her head open, takes her blood and puts it to all the different corners of the world. Um, it's very, very, very brutal. Shoots an arrow right up her stomach. It's very brutal and very specific and absolute destruction. So remember in Lord of the Rings where not just the ring got destroyed, but the whole tower just completely disintegrated and all of mortal kind of fell in. The triumph is absolute. Um, and it often happens like, uh, you know, in a bit, even in video games, like the big boss uh, is defeated in a, like, a really dramatic, big way. Um, you know those, like, in Nintendo games, they always wail and, like, hit the ground and, like, whine? Maybe you can give me some examples in the chat line of, like, like bad guys who, when they're defeated, they're, like, fully defeated in a very dramatic, often comical way. That's what happens. And so that's what happened with Marduk. It was just, like, very creative, very absolute, very severe. But then there's redemption. Now, this is an interesting... Uh, does anyone know what's happening in this photo here? Can anyone let me know? Uh, yeah, he does kind of look evil. Marduk does kind of look evil. I think that's the point I'm getting at with violence as well. A little bit later on, I will think I'll get... <laughs> Jeff's called that. This is similar to the other live Phil did about why J.K. Rowling is not writing Harry Potter. Yes. Um, this is a similar structure of how things fit together in story cycles. This is a completely different story cycle, but it is similar. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, the Ender Dragon explodes. Yes. Voldemort just fading. Star Wars. Star Wars. The Ewoks are rising. Planet of the Ewoks. Um, yes. At the end of Star Wars and Return of the Jedi, um, the Empire is destroyed. And actually, the Ewoks have a party and they play the drums on the heads of the Stormtrooper helmets. So redemption or like something comes out, some good or uh, a new way of life comes out of literally the, um, the old patterns of violence and destruction of the Empire. Um, so in the story of Tiamat and Marduk, Marduk literally rips Tiamat's body apart and creates the world with Tiamat's body and then kills one of Tiamat's supporters, Kingu, and with that blood makes people, which is pretty full on, pretty crazy, which, which ultimately means that the writers or the creators of this myth thought that people descended from a dead God, or essentially that the violence of uh, the violence just went round in a cycle. And then all of a sudden Marduk's now the head and Marduk needs to establish order and kill Tiamat once a year. And so once a year in ancient Babylon, there would be um, a celebration of this story and they would reenact this story. So it had to, had to sort of happen every year. And it was this ongoing thing and this sort of ongoing violent kind of thing. And when you think about it, there's some similarities with how society functions with this kind of story. Can anyone hit me up in the chat line and tell me how might our society be similar in cycles of violence to this cycle of violence that happens that was outlined by Walter Wink. What do you reckon, guys? Interesting that so many myths and legends have the same theme. Something being opened after a conflict and evil being unleashed into the world. Pandora's box, the Garden of Eden. Whoa, cool to make the link between the Garden of Eden and Pandora's box. I really like that. Thanks, Kieran Wyatt. What do you reckon? 
we we want to become famous by <laughs> no that's an ad people want revenge in life yeah people want revenge in life uh like politics one party wins then another launches an attack on them japan maple that's pretty good i like that um yeah absolutely uh one party comes into power and the opposition then attacks them um, or one party comes into power and is so annoyed at all the changes that the government before them made and then seeks to undo them and make ones that are kind of opposite to them in this way. And then this pendulum swings back and forth and back and forth. Uh, yeah, uh, you could say uh, almost every system that we have, and this is a bit of a bold thing to say, almost every system that we have in society is violent, whether it's food, even the most, even the most peaceful, sustainable diets, uh, you are still literally eating something that used to be alive. Um, there's nothing we eat or nothing that any, any organism eats that is, didn't used to be alive. Even autotrophic, which means they create their own food, like plants, even they have to get nutrients from things that used to be alive, things in the soil. Everything has a cycle of violence. We depend, uh, we depend on getting ahead and getting ahead means maybe something gets behind and maybe that's a violent act. Violence is everywhere. Uh, however, there's different types of violence in my view. There's retributive violence, which Walter Wink was talking about. And retributive violence often features in a whole bunch of art. So like, whether it's Tom and Jerry, like the big bad cat is trying to eat the cute little mouse and the little mouse always finds a way to get revenge and get back at that cat. And you sympathize with the mouse because the mouse has had Tammuz, this build up of this big cat against it. And it has had all of this like primal chaos in the way that it was born. It was already just so little compared to this big cat. And so it rise up as a hero, has the creative little trap door of the big hammer that slams down, is triumphant, total victory over the cat. The cat's like completely flattened. And then maybe, I don't know, maybe the, uh, the cat rolls it up and makes it into a nice, sorry, the, the mouse rolls the cat up and makes it into a nice little carpet, redemption out of it. But then that cycle continues and next week you get another Tom and Jerry cartoon. The evil is always persistent. The evil comes back again. The Joker goes to Arkham Asylum, he always comes back. Uh, you know, whichever one's the, the cat, is it Tom is the cat? Tom comes back next week, even though he got completely flattened. Wile E. Coyote comes back. Um, you know, the empire in Star Wars might get defeated, but then there's the rise of the, what is it? The first order. Yes. The cycles always come back. Um, and it's really satisfying. It's so satisfying retributive violence. It makes us feel warm and nourished and nice and good. It's like, mm, yum, yum. Get that revenge. Yeah. Get it back. Come on, little mouse. You can get it. But I've got a question for you. Why is retributive violence cycle like McDonald's? <laughs> you could say that the empire strike back. Wow. Interesting. Yeah, I like that. Why is retributive violence cycle like McDonald's? Your most creative answers. I'm going to hazard a guess here. and I'm going to say retributive violence cycle is like McDonald's because it makes you feel good. It makes you feel Mm, yeah, that was nice. But ultimately, if we just had a diet of retributive violence, it wouldn't be good for us. It's fine to have some junk food every now and then. It's fine. But as long as you know what you're doing and you know that if you had that every meal, that would not be nourishing. Uh, I think it's good and proper to have retributive violence. And there's examples, for instance, of great literature that's retributive violence, like The Count of Monte Cristo. Um, there's also a place for retributive violence in some works by, does anyone know the name of this director here? Um, uh, oh wait, it says it on that poster there. Uh, yeah, 
it's fine uh, when to get retributive violence for catharsis, for a feeling of like, yes, something needs to be made right. Like seeing a whole bunch, bunch of Nazis burnt down in a movie cinema in Inglorious Bastards or seeing some slave owners in the American South be shot up by uh, Django, Jamie Foxx. There's something deeply satisfying and maybe there's something healing about it. But ultimately what it is, uh, retributive violence, is it's casting out the other person. It's saying, you're not human. You need to be completely destroyed. You need to be out of this thing. And I would argue that there's another type of art that has a different type of violence and it's restorative violence. Restorative violence is when there's punishment violence. Now, this is going to be a weird point that I'm going to be making. Uh, this is a sociologist. Uh, he uh, came up with this study of apologies and how people rated the apology out of seven uh, as sincere or not. Um, and uh, it was no apology, a non-costly apology, or a costly apology. And his idea was that costly apologies, apologies where the person who apologizes actually um, gives something up, like uh, maybe there's a gift or maybe there's a sacrifice they have to make. Like, I'm sorry I didn't make your brother's wedding. You know what? I'm gonna cancel my weekend plans next month completely. I'm gonna, I was gonna go on a camping trip, but instead I'm gonna cancel that and I'm gonna spend time with you costly apology. It costs that person to sacrifice that camping trip. Or, look, I'm so sorry. Um, look, I bought, and the classic example, I bought you flowers. Um, it's People find that costly apologies work more. It's not about the person who's receiving the apology gaining something. It's about it literally costing or a punishment for the person apologizing, which is a weird thought, but that's the way that he has found that apologies work best in. And we find that in literature, find that in literature where if we have something that has a punishment, what that actually does is it means that we can bring it back into the fold. It doesn't have to be cast out or completely destroyed and obliterated like Tiamat was. It can actually be brought in and redeemed or restored. It's restorative violence. And so violence might have a cathartic effect in retributive violence cycles, but maybe it can have a glorious, beautiful effect sometimes, and this is in art, not in real life, if it's actually used in a restorative way to bring about a cohesiveness together. Um, and that is why violence maybe isn't as bad as you've been told. Uh, okay. Thank you so much for your contributions. I'm going to end it there. Um, I, uh, I've been working on a poem that you gave me uh, from the first words that people spoke. I've had like envelope in there, banana in there. I'm halfway through writing it right now, but next week I'm going to be doing it as well. If you have any shout outs or suggestions for some topics, please let me know anything related to art, to film, to literature, to uh, poetry, to words, anything at all. I'd love to, uh, I'd love to explore it. Um, Kieran White, thank you for your amazing ancient Greek knowledge as per, uh, but if that's it, uh, I'm going to just say goodbye to everyone. See you later. Thank you for your contributions. Um, I'm Phil Wilcox. Never trust a poet.